thank you so much for joining me. If it's the first time that you're joining me, uh, basically, uh, I have elected to uh, read the Quran aloud. Now, um, <clears throat> I did come down with something. I don't know, my throat's kind of bugging a little bit. So I appreciate your patience with me uh, during the reading. But I do have some tea to help me with the, the throat. So, all right. As always, when we're approaching the Quran, set our intention straight, make wudu, <clears throat> and um, make sure that uh, we can get the benefit and the blessing from Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. So, uh, if you're a non-Muslim, I do welcome you to join me on the panel after I finish the reading. Uh, that way, they, um, I'm happy to field any other questions that you may have in regards to Islam. So uh, please go ahead and like the stream and share the stream. And inshallah, it's, it's a benefit for everybody that's tuning in and for anybody in the future as well. Uh, so without further ado, once my intention is clear and uh, my wudu is complete, we say, Audhu Billahi Minash Shaitan Rajim, which is seeking refuge from the accursed shaitan. And we say, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. So continuing on with the ninth juz, this is Surah Al-Araf. Uh, and uh, side by side with me, I do have the um, scholarly commentary from Tafsir Sadi. I also want to preface that I'm not a scholar, and these are just my own personal reflections on the Quran as I read through it. <clears throat> okay. Uh, so with that being said, let's just go ahead and jump right in, inshallah. So said the eminent ones who were arrogant amongst his people, we will surely evict you, O Shu'aib, and those who have believed with you from our city, or you must return to our religion. He said, even if we were unwilling, uh, we would have invented against Allah a lie if we returned to your religion after Allah had saved us from it. And it is not for us to return to it, except that Allah, our Lord, should will. <clears throat> our Lord has encompassed all things in knowledge. Upon Allah, we have relied. Our Lord decide between us and our people in truth. And you are the best of those who gives a decision. So obviously, the disbelievers are always looking for a compromise. And then when a compromise isn't obtainable, uh, then it's basically an ultimatum. <clears throat> said the eminent ones who disbelieved among his people if you should follow Sha'ib indeed you would be the losers so the earthquake seized them and they became within their home corpses fallen prone those who denied Sha'ib it was as though they had never resided there those who denied Sha'ib it was they who were the losers so you know subhanAllah <clears throat> It's, it was leveled flat, almost as if they never resided there, meaning everything was brought down. And this is the, the might of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when he exacts his punishment on a nation. And by the way, um, you'll notice a, a theme in the Quran in regards to what kind of punishments uh, were exacted. So in this instance, it was an earthquake. Uh, to me, I, I fear earthquakes the most. And that's because you can't see them. You can't feel them. <clears throat> They're basically just instant. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us from that. All right, carrying on. Um, and he, Shu'ay, turned away from them and said, Oh, my people, I had certainly conveyed to you the message of my Lord and advised you. So how could, could I grieve for a disbelieving people? Meaning I, I did my job. And why should I look back? And we sent to no city a prophet who was denied, except that we seized its people with poverty and hardship, uh, that they might humble themselves to Allah. So again, that reoccurring theme of reward, punishment, but the purpose, the purpose is a just purpose in order to be humbled so that you can come back to your Lord's power of God. Uh, then we exchange in place of the bad condition good until they increased and prospered and said our fathers also were touched with hardship and ease so we seized them suddenly while they did not perceive and meaning that uh, life is ebbs and flows it's going to be a bunch of positivity and then it's also going to have its uh, negativities but it's important to be patient and remain patient and if only the people of cities had believed and feared allah we would have opened 
i.e. bestowed upon them blessings from the heaven and the earth, but they denied the messengers, so we seized them for what they were earning. Then did the people of the cities feel secure from our punishment coming to them at night while they were asleep? Or did the people of the cities feel secure from our punishment coming to them in the morning while they were at play? Then did they feel secure from the plan of Allah, but no one feels secure from the plan of Allah except the losing people. Has it not become clear to those who inherited the earth after its previous people that if we willed, we would afflict them from uh, for their sins, but we have sealed over their hearts so they do not hear? <clears throat> Uh, and again, it's a, it's a consequence. The consequence is the sealing of hearts. And he's saying, look back, look back at the people, reflect, look what happened to them, look at the punishment, look at the steps that they took, uh, look at how they conducted themselves and look at what the end result was. People think that they're safe. You're not safe at night. You're not safe during the day. <clears throat> uh, those cities we relate to you, O Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, some of their, some of their news and certainly did their messengers come to them with clear proofs, but they were not uh, to believe in that which they had denied before. Thus does Allah seal over the hearts of the disbelievers. And we did not find for most of them any covenant, but indeed we found most of them defiantly disobedient. More characteristics common with the theme that we've been reading so far. Then we sent after them Moses with our signs to Pharaoh and his establishment, but they were unjust towards them. So see how was the end of the corruptors. And again, messengers are sent, unjustly treated. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala labels them as corruptors. And uh, he prompts you to go and visit to see what their end was. And Moses said, O Pharaoh, I am a messenger from the Lord of the worlds. Who is obliged not to say about Allah except the truth? I have come to you with clear evidence from your Lord, so send with me the children of Israel. Pharaoh said, If you have come with a sign, then bring it forth, if you should be of the truthful. So he, Moses, threw his staff, and suddenly it was a serpent manifest. And uh, this is a miracle of Musa uh, There was uh, an invitation by Pharaoh. For all of the magicians to come in and, and prove Moses wrong. And basically what they would do is just some like uh, visual type magic, you know, kind of when you have like a pencil. I don't even know if it's possible to do it on this camera. I see how it kind of looks like it's all flimsy, but it's actually a sturdy pen. So they did kind of magic like that where the pens were dancing and stuff. But when Musa uh, threw his staff down, it actually did manifest into a serpent <clears throat> and uh, sucked up all the sticks. And he drew out his hand, thereupon it was white with radiance for the observers, which is another uh, miracle. Said the eminent among the people of Pharaoh, indeed, this is a learned magician who wants to expel you from your land through magic. So what do you instruct? They said, postpone the matter uh, of, uh, postpone the matter of him and his brother and send them among the city gatherers who will bring you every learned magician. And the magicians came to Pharaoh they said, indeed, for us is a reward if we are predominant. He said, yes, and moreover, you will be among those made near to me. So there's a huge reward for the, basically almost like a, a bounty. If they can complete this task, you get a, a said bounty. Excuse me, you get a said bounty. They said, O oh Moses, either you throw your staff or we will be the ones to throw first. Uh, he said, throw, and then they threw. They bewitched the eyes of the people and struck terror into them. And they presented a great feat of magic. So once again, you know, flimsy pen kind of thing, but it's actually solid. And we inspired to Moses, throw your staff. And at once it devoured what they were falsifying. So the truth was established and abolished uh, was what they were doing, i.e. Pharaoh and his people were overcome right, right there and became debased. And the, magician, the magicians fell down in prostration to a lost panel. Data. So look, these guys know, <clears throat> obviously these guys know, uh, especially when they're dealing with magic, when they know the difference between some like little small whiff-waff stuff and uh, an actual miracle taking place. 
Uh, this was their response. They said, we have believed in the Lord of the worlds, the Lord of Moses and Aaron. Said Pharaoh, you believe in him before I gave you permission. Indeed, this is a conspiracy which you conspired in the city to expel therefrom its people. Uh, but you are going to know. So he threatened them and he says, you know, conspiracy, how could you guys do this? Uh, I will surely cut off your hands and your feet on opposite sides. Then I will surely crucify you all. So obviously, um, crucifixion, nothing new, right? Uh, he threatened them with crucifixion and he threatened them in uh, uh, basically mutilation. And he says, uh, I will crucify you all. They said, indeed to our Lord, we will return. Meaning, look, uh, we've got enough proof. We don't, you can threaten us all you want and we're going, we're going to our Lord after seeing this. And you do not resent us except because we believe in the signs of our Lord uh, when they came to us. Our Lord, pour upon us patience and let us die as Muslims in submission to you. Uh, and the eminent one among the people of Pharaoh said, Will you leave Moses and his people to cause corruption in the land and abandon you and your gods? Pharaoh said, we will kill your, we will kill their sons and keep their women alive. And indeed we are subjugators over them. So <clears throat> Pharaoh had a plan. Okay. He had a plan and he wanted to execute this plan. And it was a very, very wicked plan. Uh, said Moses to his people, seek help through Allah and be patient. Indeed, the earth belongs to Allah. He causes to inherit it whom he wills of his servants and the best outcome is for the righteous, meaning stay on the path of righteousness in the face of adversity. Things can take time, but righteousness, truth, um, all these things uh, indeed will prevail. They said, we have been harmed before you came to us and after you came to us. He said, perhaps your Lord will destroy your enemy and grant you succession in the land and see how you will do. And we certainly seized the people of Pharaoh with years of famine and a deficiency in fruits that perhaps they would be reminded. So again, he's exacting the punishment, but it's for the principles of mercy and justice. So these punishments are used as a reminder to give him, to give him notice of who the true uh, God of the world is. That way that they can come back to him, meaning repent. But when good provision came to them, they said, this is ours by right. And if a bad condition struck them, they saw an evil omen in Moses and those with him. Unquestionably, their fortune is with Allah, but most of them do not know. Uh, this is a very, very common thing that happens in life, which is basically the blame game. So when you see something bad happening to you, you're quick to jump and blame somebody else rather than yourself. So the Quran reminds us here that we have to check ourselves first. And see if we did anything wrong. That way that we can improve our status with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And they said, no matter what sign you bring us with which to bewitch us, we will not be believers in you. <clears throat> so we sent upon them the flood and locusts and, and lice and frogs and blood as distinct signs. But they were arrogant and were a criminal people. Again, uh, characteristics of, of disbelief, arrogance, criminality, injustice. And when the punishment descended upon them, they said, O oh Moses, invoke for us your Lord by what he has promised you. If you can remove the punishment from us, we will surely believe you and we will send with you the children of Israel. But when we remove the punishment from them until a term which they were to reach, then at once they broke their word. So they made a covenant with Musa and they made a covenant with a representative of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they broke that covenant. So we took retribution from them and we drowned them in the sea because they denied our signs and were heedless of them. So signs are constantly there from within us, from without, but it's the heedlessness that gets people along with other uh, characteristics of disbelief. And we caused the people who have been oppressed to inherit the eastern regions of the land and the western ones which we had blessed and the good word which is the decree of your lord was fulfilled for the children of israel because of what they had patiently endured and we destroyed all that pharaoh and his people were producing and what they had been building and we took the children of israel across the sea 
Then they came upon a people intent in devotion, which is some idols of theirs. They, the children of Israel, said, O oh Moses, make for us a God just like they have gods. He said, Indeed, you are a people behaving ignorantly. Indeed, those worshipers destroyed, uh, indeed, those worshipers destroyed is that in which they are engaged in, and worthless is whatever they were doing. He said, It is to a law that I should desire for you a Excuse me. He said, is it other than Allah I should desire for you as a God while he has preferred you over the worlds? And recall, O children of Israel, when we saved you from the people of Pharaoh who were afflicting you with the worst torment, killing your sons and keeping your women alive. And in that was a great trial from your Lord. Now, this really blows my mind, actually, uh, because... After witnessing, after witnessing all of the things that went down, even the people that were following Moses were upon a weak form of faith, meaning, <clears throat> excuse me, not all of them, because I, I don't want to speak in absolutes. But according to what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, there, are, there were a, a, a good deal of them, right? Uh, meaning it, it's enough to be mentioned in the Quran. So when they saw idolatry, even after they saw the miracles that transpired of being saved, and after they patiently endured with everything, and they were walking with Musa alayhi salam, they still wanted idols. They still wanted something else. Like, subhanAllah. Uh, oh, recall children of Israel. Uh, yes, okay. And we made an appointment with Moses for 30 nights and perfected them uh, by the addition of 10. So the term of his Lord was completed as 40 nights. And Moses said to his brother Aaron, take my place amongst my people, do right by them, and do not follow the way of the corruptors. And when Moses arrived at our appointed time, and his Lord spoke to him, he said, my Lord, show me yourself that I may look at you. And Allah said, you will not see me. Uh, but look at the mountain. If it should remain in place, then you will see me. But when his Lord appeared to the mountain, he rendered it level, meaning the mountain uh, collapsed <clears throat> and Moses fell unconscious. And when he awoke, he said, exalted are you. I have repented to you and I am the first among my people of the believers. Now, just a, a, again, a personal reflection on here. I can only imagine what the size of this mountain was. It wasn't some like dinky molehill, okay? Rather, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted to give him an example. So he probably said, you know, the mountain that he gave could have been like gigantic. And imagine <clears throat> seeing this mountain, having the event transpire, collapsing, waking up, and this thing is just not there, right? Um, I, I, for one, would for sure freak out. I would be like, wow, this is obviously, this is my Lord. And obviously he is um, beyond, beyond the beyond, right? If something like this can happen. So imagine the aftermath of what, of what transpired, right? Even though that we can just very quickly gloss over something like this, you know, it's not like these people had like, skyscrapers or something like that rather the guy just saw an entire mountain collapse right or at least he witnessed it in in ruin okay Allah said O Moses I have chosen you over the people with my message and my word to you so take what I have given you and be among the grateful <clears throat> and we wrote for him on the tablet something of all things instruction and explanation for all things saying Take them with determination and order your people to take the best of it. I will show you the home of the defiantly disobedient. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is showing him exactly what um, hellfire is. I will turn away from my signs, uh, those who are arrogant upon the earth without right. And if they should see every sign, they will not believe in it. And if they should see the way of consciousness, they will not adopt it as a way. But if they see the way of error, they will adopt it as a way. That is because they have denied our signs and they were heedless of them. So again, there's a pattern. Now, interesting here that the word consciousness is used because really 
uh, one of the coolest things about Islam is it touches up on the three fundamental questions. Where did we come from? What are we doing here? And where are we going? Okay. This is the three like critical questions that every single human being at one point or another <clears throat> asks themselves in, in their life. And Islam has an answer. Now notice the term consciousness as if you're waking up, right? You're regaining consciousness. So you're going from, from sleep to being awake. Um, and he says, and if they see the way of consciousness, meaning if they see that revival, if they see that wake up call, okay, they will not adopt it as a way, which is pretty profound. Okay, carrying on. <clears throat> Those who denied our signs and the meeting of the hereafter, their deeds have become worthless. Are they recompensed except for what they used to do? So for the people that do good deeds like charity and <clears throat> helping others and all that stuff, but they're not believers, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves the act of good that they're committing, and therefore they're rewarded in this world for that act of good. They can be recognized as a charitable person, uh, they can have calamities uh, removed from them, and so on. But when it comes to a status of disbelief, if after all of that, they still ignore Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's signs, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will say to them that he rewarded them in this world, and that's exactly the reward that they were seeking because they stopped 50 percent of the way should they seek the hereafter and they do all these charities for the sake of allah rather than just for the sake of themselves or for the sake of recognition then rightfully so and justly so allah subhanahu wa will complete it full circle they will get the reward of this world and they'll get the reward of the next so uh, don't cut yourself short if you're somebody that's in a status of disbelief and the people of Moses made after their after his departure from their ornaments a calf, an image having a low a lowing sound. Did they not see that it could neither speak to them nor guide them to a way? They took it for worship, and they were wrongdoers. And when regret overcame them, and they saw that they had gone astray, they said, "If our Lord does not have mercy upon us and forgive us, we will surely be among the losers." Now, interestingly enough, <coughs> this is, um, notice the term being used earlier was corruption, okay? So if you had a community, let's say there was 50 of them, um, it wasn't maybe that all of them were upon disbelief. Maybe, let's call it 10, right? And then these 10 started spreading the corruption and the, and the, the cancerous kind of thought process was... Um, taking hold of people one by one, right? Shaitan was doing his dirty work. Those 10 turned into 20, 20 turned into, turned into 30, which is now the majority. The minority felt overwhelmed and they said, okay, you know what? Maybe we should build this calf. So we don't know the time that elapsed between this in its entirety and how quickly the corruption spread. But what we do know is that the corruption did indeed happen. We do know that at one point in time, they uh, many of them were upon belief, but now they felt confident enough because their forces increased to build this calf. However, the great part about it is uh, they when they were overcome with regret and witnessed that they went astray, uh, they turned back to Allah's power of Allah, lest they should be losers. So something really to keep note of. And when Moses returned to his people angry and grieved, he said, how wretched is that by which you have replaced me after my departure? Were you impatient over the matter of your Lord? And he threw down the, ta uh, the tablets and seized his brother by the hair uh, of his head, pulling him towards him. And Aaron said, oh, son of my mother, indeed, the people overpowered me and were about to kill me. Okay, cool. So, yeah, the insight, the insight holds true. Right, the people overpowered him. So obviously he was on the side of belief, knowing that he's Moses' brother. But the people ended up that the majority started getting greater and greater, and the corruption started getting greater and greater. So let not the enemies rejoice over me and do not place me among the wrongdoing people. Moses said, My Lord, forgive me and my brother, and admit us into your mercy, for you are the most merciful of the merciful. <clears throat> And again, this is a beautiful du'a. So you can be saying a prophetic du'a right here when you're making supplication. 
you can say this to Ah, and then you know say uh, Amin after that. Indeed, those who took the calf for worship will obtain anger from their Lord and humiliation in the life of this world, and thus do we recompense the inventors of falsehood. So, obviously, there's going to be people that fall out and resist and say, you know what? No, I'm going to continue worshiping this calf. Uh, but those who committed misdeeds and then repented after them and believed, indeed, your Lord thereafter is forgiving and merciful. So naturally, there's people that, you know, woke up and said, hey, you know, uh, we're doing we're doing some something wrong here. OK. Uh, and when the anger should subside in Moses, he took up the tablets and in their inscription was a guidance and a mercy for those who are fearful of their Lord. And Moses chose from his people 70 men for our appointment. And when the earthquake seized them, he said, my Lord, if you had willed, you could have destroyed them before me, uh, before and me as well. Would you destroy us for what the foolish among us have done? This is not but your trial by which you send astray whom you will and guide whom you will. You are our protector. So forgive us and have mercy upon us. And uh, you are the best of forgivers. So subhanAllah, here you have it. You have an insight as to how many of them were in the in the majority, which was 70 at one point. And then, or excuse me, um, at least 70 were on, a, on perpetual disbelief. So at least 70, but it could have been more. So let's say, for example, if there was 200 of them and then it went, the corruption started with 10, it reached 70, hit the majority at 110. And then now after Musa Aleyhisselam came back, people repented and it dropped to 70 people that were defiantly disobedient and also hit the other characteristics. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala exacted the punishment on those that were perpetually defiantly disobedient. And he gave mercy to the other ones that uh, turned to him in repentance. Okay. And decree for us in this world that which is good and also in the hereafter. Indeed, we have turned back to you. Allah said, my punishment, I afflict with it whom I will, but my mercy encompasses all things. So I will decree it, especially for those who fear me and give zakat, which is charity, and those who believe in our verses. So, hey, mercy is especially reserved for people who are charitable and who believe in, the, in, in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's verses. It is a decree, okay? Those who follow the messenger, the unlettered prophet, which is Muhammad, whom they find written, described in what they have of the Torah and the gospel. Now, gospel here is the Injil. So not the book of Mark, Matthew, Luke, and John, but rather the gospel of Jesus, uh, who enjoins upon them what is right and prohibits them from what is wrong and makes lawful for them what is good and forbids them from what is evil and relieves them of their burden and the shackles which were upon them. The burden and the shackles here is referencing disbelief. Uh, so they who have believed in him, honored him, supported him, and followed the light which was sent down with him, which is the Quran, it is those who will be the successful. So the revelations that were sent down. Now notice the Quran is claiming here that there was a uh, there was a prophecy in the previous scriptures. Now, um, and I really do believe that uh, naturally, I believe that the scriptures were corrupted because the Quran says so, and the Quran is the criterion uh, for judgment. Uh, however, I do believe that there are still fragments of these prophecies, especially if you were to read Isaiah 42. You can see very uh, plainly that this is talking about Prophet Muhammad. And then there's some uh, additional, um, you know, uh, fragments that are you can check out debates about it, like Deuteronomy 18.18 or Isaiah 53. Um, so I encourage you to check some of that stuff out. But I really do believe that Isaiah 42 is, is probably the strongest case. Uh, let me let me preface that strongest simplest case of um, the prophecy of Muhammad Say, O Muhammad, uh, O oh mankind, indeed I am the messenger of Allah to you. For him to whom belongs the dominions of the heaven and the earth, there is no deity except him. He gives life and causes death. So believe in Allah and His messenger, the unlettered prophet, who believes in Allah and His words, and follow Him, that you may be guided. And among the people of Moses is a community which guides by truth and by it establishes justice. And now, obviously, those are still the, the Muslims of the time. And we divided them into 12 descendant tribes 
as distinct nations, and we inspire to Moses when his people implored him for water, strike with your staff the stone, and there gushed forth from it twelve springs. Every people, which is the tribe, knew its watering place, and we shaded them with clouds, and we sent down upon them manna and quails, saying, Eat from the good things uh, with which we have provided for you. Uh, which we have provided you. And they wronged us not, but they were only wronging themselves. And mention, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when it was said to them, dwell in this city, which was Jerusalem, and eat from it wherever you will, and say, relieve us of our burdens, which is the sins, and enter the gate, bowing humbly. Uh, we will then forgive you your sins. We will increase the doers of good in goodness and reward. But those who wronged among them changed the words to a statement other than which, which, which had been said to them. So we sent upon them a punishment from the sky for the wrong that they were doing. So here's uh, even more uh, claims of corruption. And said to them, and asked them about the town that was by the sea, when they transgressed in the matter of the Sabbath, when their fish came to them openly on their Sabbath day, and the day they had no Sabbath, they did not come to them. Thus did we give them a trial, because they were defiantly disobedient. And when community among them said, Why do you advise or warn a people of, uh, whom Allah is about to destroy or to punish with a severe punishment? They, the advisors, said to be absolved before your Lord, and perhaps they might fear him. <clears throat> so the messengers were a mercy. And when they, i.e. those advised, forgot that by which they had been uh, reminded, we saved those who had forbidden evil and seized those who wronged with a wretched punishment because they were defiantly disobeying. And again, uh, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is administering justice. He is not uh, just doing stuff willy-nilly. It's just we don't believe in that kind of a Lord, uh, period. And alhamdulillah for that. So when they were insolent about that which they had been forbidden, we said to them, be apes despised. And mention when your Lord declared that he would surely continue to send upon them the day of resurrection, those who would afflict them with the worst torment. Indeed, your Lord is swift in penalty, but indeed he is forgiving and merciful. And we divided them throughout the earth into nations. Of them, some were righteous and of them some were otherwise, and we tested them with good times and bad, that perhaps they would return to obedience. So again, system of reward, system of punishment, but the purpose, the grand purpose is once again to come back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And they followed them, uh, and there followed them successors who inherited the scripture while taking the uh, commodities of this lower life and saying, it will be forgiven for us. And if an offer... Uh, and if an offer like it comes to them, they will again take it. Was not the covenant of the scripture, i.e. the Torah, taken from them? And they would not say about Allah except the truth. And they studied what was, uh, what was in it. And the home of the hereafter is better for those who fear Allah. So will you not use your reason or will you not use reason? So um, this is pretty interesting as well, meaning that not only did they change or exchange the hereafter for some miserly, you know, price, some little petty price, but um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that if something else came about of the worldly life, they would have done it again. So any other type of covenant, whether it been like power, whether it been glory, whether it been whatever, uh, Meaning it's giving us an insight into the characteristics of these people. Um, because remember, the Quran is dealing with your soul. It's dealing directly with you as a person, uh, not what you're faking. But those who hold fast to the book, i.e. the Quran and establish prayer, indeed, we will not allow to be lost the reward of the reformers. So once again, it's, it's going to reward people that um, <clears throat> push themselves and squeeze through the the uh, growth process of the self and mention when we raised the mountains above them as if it was a dark cloud and they were certain that it would fall upon them and Allah said take what we have given you with determination and remember what is in it that you might fear Allah 
and mention when your Lord took from the children of Adam from their loins their descendants and made them testify of themselves, saying to them, Am I not your Lord? They said, Yes, we have testified. This, lest you should say on the day of resurrection, indeed, we were of this unaware. So obviously, this is a this is a conversation uh, that we had with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, from a different realm. Okay. And uh, there is a there is a discussion about this in in, in regards to um, uh, whether or not we were asked to come here and take the test, and we testify to Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala that we're we're happy to take the test and that He is our Lord. So now it's it, it, when you thread the Quran and why it's called a dhikr. Uh, and why it tells you, and remember when, and remember when, and to remind you, and to remind you, it's because it's talking about that event that you have forgotten because of the name Insan, which is uh, one that is forgetful, right? Um, you, as an individual, have forgotten the covenant that you made with your Lord. And that covenant was, is Bala Shahidna, which is, I do testify, and I see that you are my Lord. And now, if you were to sincerely approach the Quran, which is the message of your Lord, you will use it as a reminder to reconnect with him and uh, naturally live the best life here and earn the best reward in the hereafter, inshallah. Well, lest you say it was only that our fathers associated others in worship with Allah before, and we were but descendants after them. Then would you destroy us for what the falsifiers have done? And thus do we explain in detail the verses and perhaps they will return. Notice, return, meaning you started with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you're going to return back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? And recite to them, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the news of him to whom we gave knowledge of our signs. But he detached himself from them. So Satan pursued him and he became of the deviators. And if we had willed, we could have elevated him thereby. But he adhered instead to the earth and followed his own desires. So his example is like that of the dog. If you chase him, he pants. If you leave him, he still pants. That is the example of the people who denied our signs. So relate the stories that perhaps they will give thought. Now, um, I'm going to see if I can expand upon this in the tafsir, but based on my own personal reflection, uh, shaitan is, is like a wolf. And if you're isolated, his job is to uh, take advantage of that isolation. Meaning if you don't surround yourself with good company, good thoughts, good practices, uh, do the, the, the thing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells you to do, it's very easy for him to hunt you down. And when he hunts you down, he's going to make your desires seem alluring to you, and you're eventually going to falter to that. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that it's like a dog. So whether you're doing something like chasing him or, uh, you know, leaving him still, he's just sitting there with his tongue out, kind of stupefied and not really, not really doing anything. He's just kind of panting, right? Um, <clears throat> but let's see what the tafsir, uh, what the tafsir says about this. So let me just really quickly locate this. Because uh, it, we did cover uh, a pretty good amount of ground. So we're down to verse 176. And let's see. Almost there. And... Okay. Uh, here Allah says to his prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, recount to them the story of the man whom we gave knowledge of our revelations, that is, we taught him knowledge of the book of Allah. So he became a great and prominent scholar, but he disregarded it. Then shaitan caught up with him. That is, he shunned the attributes that are expected of one who has knowledge of the revelations of Allah. Because knowledge thereof should make a person acquire the noblest of characteristics, do the best of deeds, and be elevated to the highest levels, highest of levels and most sublime of statuses. But this man threw the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala behind his back and cast aside the manners and conduct enjoined by the book, like one would shed his clothes. 
When he disregarded it, the Shaitan caught up with him and gained power over him when he departed from the strong fortress and enticed him to sin. Thus he became the lowest of the low, and he became one of the misguided. After he had been one of those who were guided and guided others, that is because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forsook him and left him to his own devices. Hence Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, If it had been our will, we would have honored him thereby, by enabling him to act upon it and rise in status, this world and the hereafter. Thus he would be protected from his enemies. But he did not uh, he did that which led to him being deprived of divine help so he clung to the earth that is to base desires and worldly aims meaning he may have turned into like a scholar for a dollar you know scholars for dollars i mean these people are like the worst most despicable they're committing massively massively heinous crimes uh and he stopped obeying his lord his likeness in terms of his eagerness for worldly gain and his total devotion to it is that of a dog. If you chase him away, he pants with his tongue lolling, and if you leave him alone, he still pants with his tongue lolling. That is, he remains with his tongue lolling out in all situations, and this person remains at all times eager for worldly gain, and no gains he makes can satisfy his desires. Such is the likeness of those who reject our revelation after Allah made them available to them. They did not submit, rather they disbelieved in them and rejected them because of their insignificance before Allah and because of their following of their whims and desires without guidance from Allah. So again, it was a consequence. And just like a dog lolling, uh, he's never going to be satiated. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, how evil an example is that of the people who denied our signs and used to wrong themselves. Whoever Allah guides, he is the rightly guided, and whoever he sends astray, it is those who are the losers. And remember, he guides you based on your actions, which is a consequence, and he sends you astray based on your actions and intentions, which is also a consequence. So when you come across verses like this, you, you always say the affirmative, which is, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, Ya Allah, please make me of those that are rightly guided and, and prevent me of those from being that are sent astray. Amin. Uh, and we have certainly created for hell many of the jinn and mankind. They have hearts with which they do not understand. They have eyes with which they do not see. And they have ears with which they do not hear. Those are like livestock. Rather, they are more astray. It is they who are the heedless. So you're worse than cattle. You're literally like you have a brain, you can think, you have all these beautiful things going for you, but it's, you know, you're you're lower than an animal. Uh, and the reason why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says this, and, and again, in my own personal reflection is um, animals, uh, they're Muslim, right? They're Muslim by default. They submit to their creator by default. It's their purpose to graze the land, to, you know, spread manure, to provide happiness to provide loyalty to till the land to be beautiful they're muslim by default so um you know when you come across an animal that's why we treat them with care uh, apart from them being a creation of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by default they are muslim okay because they're submitting they're, they're instinctual instinctually muslim not like you know you and me where we have higher cognitive faculties it's not like you're going to give a pig a pen and it's going to start writing a book no it's not going to do that but a pig is muslim <laughs> right? It's following the thing. Now, forbidden for you is eating the flesh of swine, right? Now, it doesn't matter if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forbid us to eat, for, forbade us to eat birds or cow or whatever. It doesn't matter. He chose pigs and it's for, for many reasons apart from it being a bottom feeder and so on and so on and so on. But every single animal is indeed a Muslim. And to Allah belong the best names, so invoke him by them and leave the company of those who practice deviation concerning his names they will be recompensed for what they have been doing. And among those we created is a community which guides by truth and thereby establishes justice. Now, this is uh, you, right? This, if you are living your life justly, and if you're being a good person and you're following the commands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you're part of that community. But those who deny our signs, we will progressively lead them to destruction from where they do not know. Meaning, you know, it's a, it's a paradoxical or a, it's a conundrum, right? Not a paradox, but it's a conundrum. How would you know if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is actually leading you towards victory or leading you towards your doom, right? 
and he gives you the clues it's based on your character and what you're doing based on his guidelines so even if you're having a tough time he's still leading you to victory should you be a believer following the good characteristics now if you're a bad person and having a really good time that's when it's really dangerous because your internal compass is totally jacked up you're following your own desires everything's a, a feel-good feeling and you think you're on top of the world but in the end you're going towards your doom and I will give them time. Indeed, my plan is firm. Meaning, take all the time that you need. It's no problem. The plan's not going to change. And there's nothing you can do about it. Uh, then, do they not give thought? Meaning, hey, think about this for a second. This is in their companion, i.e. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa No madness. He is not but a clear warrant. It's because they used to make fun of the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa They used to call him a madman. Uh, do they not look into the realm of the heavens and the earth and everything that Allah has created and think that perhaps their appointed time has come near? Meaning, if you look at everything around you, everything has a beginning and everything has an end, right? Everything. There's an opposite of everything. You have left, right, sun, moon, uh, light, dark. You have life, uh, uh, excuse me, you have birth. And you have death, and naturally, you have life, and the opposite is afterlife. Okay? So, carrying on. Um, uh, yes, here we are. Okay, Bismillah. So, in what state, uh, i.e. message, hereafter will they believe? Whoever Allah sends astray, whoever Allah sends astray, there is no guide for him. And he leaves him in their transgression, wandering blindly. Okay. They ask you, O Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, about the hour. When is its arrival? Say its knowledge is only with my Lord. None will reveal its time except him. It lays heavily upon the heavens and the earth, and it will not come upon you except unexpectedly. They ask you as if you are familiar with it. Say its knowledge is only with Allah, but most of the people do not know. And here's the deal. Um it doesn't matter when the final hour is because chances are none of us are going to be there, right? What, what matters is that you have your hour and that you have your, your plan and your works and your efforts set forth for your hour. That's why the Prophet said, don't worry about the time of the hour, rather worry about what you prepared for yours, right? Um, say, I hold not for myself the power of benefit or harm except what Allah has willed and if I knew the unseen I could have acquired much wealth and no harm would have touched me I am not except a warner and a bringer of good tidings to a people who believe now this is more of an attestation to the validity of the prophet Sam's prophethood because he was just a human being he was afflicted by fevers he received wounds he felt hunger uh, he felt pain. He felt loss of family. Um, you know, so he doesn't have access to anything, you know, that, like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does, period. He's just a warner uh, and a messenger. It is he who created you from one soul and created from its mate that he might dwell in security with her. And when he, i.e. the man, covers her, she carries a light burden, which is pregnancy, and continues therein. And when it becomes heavy, they both invoke Allah, their Lord. If you should give us a good child, we will surely be among the grateful. Now, I'm going to tell you guys something. If you yourself have not had the blessing of having a child yet, I promise you this is true. I promise you this is true. Because these were the exact exact thoughts that were going through my head. I just I don't care about anything else. Just let them be happy, healthy, and let them be in service to you. And so on and so on and so on. And I'll be grateful, right? Okay. So, uh, but when he gives them a good child, they ascribe partners to him concerning that which he has given them. Exalted is Allah above what they associated with him. Now, obviously, this is talking about people that are upon disbelief. Alhamdulillah. Uh, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala keep me upon belief. Uh, do they associate with him those who create nothing and they are themselves created? And they, i.e. the false deities, are unable to give them help, nor can they help themselves. And if you believers invite them to guidance, 
they will not follow you. It is all the same for you, whether you invite them or you are silent. Indeed, those you polytheists call upon besides Allah are servants, i.e. creations like you. So call upon them and let them respond to you if you should be truthful. Do they have feet by which they walk? Or do they have hands by which they strike? Or do they have eyes by which they see? Or do they have ears by which they hear? Say, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, call your partners and then conspire against me and give me no respite. I mean, you just have to use the basics, the basics of reason, the basics of just reflection. And um, that this is the arguments of the Quran. It's not about being some uh, crazy scholar. You know what I mean? It's, it's meant for everyone. Indeed, my protector is Allah and, uh, who has sent down the book and he is an ally to the righteous. And those you call upon besides him are unable to help you, nor can they help themselves. And if you invite them to guidance, they do not hear and you see them looking at you while they do not see. Take what is given freely, enjoin what is good, and turn away from the ignorant. Meaning if somebody's just really down that path and trying to pull you, just let them be. Uh, and if an evil suggestion comes to you from Satan, then seek refuge in Allah. Indeed, he is hearing and knowing. Indeed, those who fear Allah, when an impulse touches them from Satan, they remember him, and at once they have insight. Uh, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us of those. Uh, but their brothers, they, i.e. the devils, increase them in error, then they do not stop short. Meaning, before you even get to it, stop short before you get to it. Right? Keep a distance. And when you, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, do not bring them a sign, i.e. a miracle, they say, why have you not contrived it? Say, I only follow what is revealed to me from, from my Lord. This Quran is enlightenment from your Lord and guidance and mercy for a people who believe. So when the Quran is recited, they uh, then listen to it and pay attention that you may receive mercy and remember your Lord within yourself in humility and in fear without being apparent in speech in the mornings and in the evenings and do not be amongst the heedless. Basically, you have two conditions, right? It just boils down to two conditions or two statuses. You're either in a status of belief or you're in a status of disbelief. If you make your intention for everything that you do for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, okay, even if it means consuming uh, food for the purposes of energy so you can worship, if you have a spouse putting a smile on their face to see them happy because it makes Allah happy because you're supposed to treat your spouse well, uh, and I'll, I'll even go to the extent of, you know, we have du'as for when before we go to the bathroom and when we leave the bathroom. It's a blessing to be able to relieve yourself and to be thankful that you have that blessing is a form of worship. Now, on the opposite end is a state of disbelief, meaning that you are just ignoring all the blessings and you're going kind of zombie-like through life, right? That's pretty bad, right? So I'm not saying that you have to be uh, at a level. And may, inshallah, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make you of that level where you are constantly aware, right? But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is encouraging you to think of me all the time, right? Because it's only of benefit. Uh, indeed, those who are near your Lord, i.e. the angels, are not prevented by arrogance from his worship, and they exalt him, and they prostrate Fantastic. So we finished that surah and we're starting the very next one. Uh, this is Surah Al Anfal. So we say, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. They ask you, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, about the bounties of war. Say the decision concerning bounties is for Allah and the Messenger. So fear Allah and amend that which is between you and obey Allah and His Messenger if you should be believers. So again, for anybody that's a hadith rejector, you're actually rejecting the Quran. Because it tells you clearly to obey the messenger uh, should you be believers so you're upon a state of disbelief if you disobey the messenger the believers are only those who when allah mentioned their hearts become fearful and when his verses are recited to them it increases them in faith and upon their lord they rely the ones who establish prayer and from what we have provided them they spend 
Those are the believers truly for them are degrees of high position with their Lord and forgiveness and noble provision. It is just as when your Lord brought you out of your home for battle of, for the battle of Badr. In truth, while indeed a party among the believers were unwilling. So some people really, they were just like, eh, no, I don't really want to do that. Um, arguing with you concerning the truth after it had become clear as if they were being driven towards death while they were looking on. Remember, O believers, when Allah promised you one of the two groups that it would be yours and you wished that the unarmed one would be yours. But Allah intended to establish the truth by his word and to eliminate the disbelievers. <clears throat> and when he should establish the truth and abolish falsehood, even if the criminals disliked it. Remember when you were asking help of your Lord and he answered you, indeed, I will reinforce you with a thousand from the angels following one another. And Allah made it not but good tidings and so that your hearts would be assured thereby, the victory is not but from Allah. Indeed, Allah is exalted in might and wise. Remember when he overwhelmed you with the drowsiness, giving security from him, and sent, you, uh, and sent down upon you from the sky rain by which to purify you, and remove from you the evil suggestions of Satan, and to make steadfast your hearts and plant firm, uh, firmly thereby your feet. Now here's the deal. If you can put yourself in a time where you're on a battlefield, um, actually, you know what? Take it. Let's let's take it like a thousand degrees less. Let's say you had a very critical moment going on tomorrow, like an examination for college, uh, or uh, you were applying for a job and your in-person interview is there, like your final interview. You're not going to really have the best sleep the night before, right? You're not going to be. Your heart's not going to be at ease. So this is one of the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he bestows upon believers to give them firmness and to strengthen their resolve. They fell into a nice sleep and then and then also the water coming down to purify them, right? They just had ablution. They made wudu, right? They had access to resources, meaning they refilled their canteens so they could fight, right? Now, what do you think happened to the other guys? Were they filled with the same stuff? No. And when your Lord inspired to the angels, I am with you, so strengthen those who have believed. I will cast terror into the hearts of those who disbelieve. So strike them upon the necks and strike them, uh, strike from them every fingertip. Meaning, these guys got the opposite and they got some of the harshest treatment. Um, even though that a strike upon the neck is a form of mercy, but he also says strike from them every fingertip, meaning like these people were, they were really, really wicked people. And this is because they oppose the law and his messenger and whoever opposes a law and his messenger, indeed a law is severe in penalty. I mean, um, it would be, it would be very, very painful because you would probably feel every single one of your fingers, right? It's not like, oh, you know, something happened at the wrist and there's only one. You know, you've got 10 different instances of, you know, pain. That is yours, so taste it. And indeed, for the disbelievers is the punishment of the fire. Oh, you who have believed. When you meet those who disbelieve advancing in battle, do not turn to your back, turn them your backs retreating. And whoever turns his back to them on such a day, unless swerving as strategy for war or joining another company, has certainly returned with anger upon him from Allah and his refuge is hell and wretched is the destination. Meaning we're fighting for keeps. Uh, we're not, we're not doing this, uh, you know, 50, 50 thing where we're, we're going to, you know, try to fake it and then get up there and no, 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 no. This is, you know, a military style jihad vis -a -vis -a and you know where your destination is. And the beautiful thing about Islam is you win no matter what, if you're upon belief, you will win no matter what, right? Uh, and you did not kill them, but it was Allah who killed them. And you threw not, O Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, when you threw, but it was Allah who threw, meaning that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was with them. Uh, and he might test the believers with a good test. Indeed, Allah is hearing and knowing. That is so, and also that Allah will weaken the plot of the disbelievers. Meaning that the conditions can change, you know, plans change on the first day of battle. A 
think Mike Tyson was said, everything's good with your plan until you get punched in the face. You know what I mean? So a punch to the face would be terror. A punch to the face would be rain, change of landscape, and so on. If you disbelieve or seek the decision, i.e. victory, the decision, i.e. defeat, has come to you. And if you desist from hostilities, it is best for you. But if you return to war, we will return, and never will you be av- will you be availed by your large company at all, even if it should increase. And that is because Allah is with the believers. Meaning, it's not about the size of the company. Rather, it's about which side that you're on. And if you're on the side of justice, truth, uh, righteousness, belief, then uh, God is on your side. O oh, you who have believed, obey Allah and his messenger, and do not turn from him while you hear his order. And do not be like those who say, we have heard, while they do not hear. Indeed, the worst of living creatures in the sight of Allah are the deaf and the dumb who do not use reason, which is the disbelievers. Because remember, it's a consequence. They're perpetually in a state of denial. Perpetually. And they're constantly, constantly, constantly thinking up of excuses not to use their reason. And this is the issue. Had Allah known any good in them, he would have made them hear. And if he had made them hear, they would still have turned away while they were refusing. So now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is all-knowing, meaning these people had no good in them, period. And had he would have made them hear, they still would have turned away while they were refusing. Okay, so they were in a state of refusal. And the consequence turned away. Okay, consequence, disbelief. Oh, you who have believed, respond to Allah and to the messenger when he calls you to that which gives you life, which is the Quran, and uh, as well as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? And know that Allah intervenes between a man and his heart, and that to him you will be gathered, and fear a trial which will not strike those who have wronged among you exclusively, and know that Allah is severe in penalty. Carrying on. And remember, when you were few and oppressed in the land, fearing the people might abduct you, but he sheltered you, supported you with his victory, and provided you with good tidings, that you might be grateful. O oh, you who have believed, do not betray Allah and the Messenger, or betray your trusts while you know the consequences. And know that your properties and your children are but a trial and that Allah has with him a great reward. So this is again in reference to, uh, because as Muslims, we believe that if a child were to pass away, they're immediately granted paradise. And obviously the parents and the grandparents and everybody else would, would continue on as that being part of their trial, right? So uh, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us from that trial because it is indeed a severe trial. And mean, and um, know that uh, with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is that great reward. So it's you're you're supposed to the, the Prophet said that to treat this world like a traveler. You come, you take what you need, leave good things, uh, and that you treat people well and know that you're returning back to uh, where your where your actual home is, which is the hereafter with with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Oh you who have believed if you fear Allah he will grant you a criterion and will move from you your misdeeds and forgive you. And Allah is the possessor of great bounty. And remember, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when those who disbelieve plotted against you to restrain you or kill you or evict you from Mecca, but they plan and Allah plans and Allah is the best of planners. And this is another attestation to his miraculous survival. I can't imagine how many assassination attempts, uh, how many, you know, unspoken events uh, and, and circumstances were put up against him. But the fact that he, alayhi salam, survived for 23 years is a miracle to me, right? Especially in uh, tribal Arabia where there's limited water and he had to trek this journey on foot in like the harshest conditions. I mean, really think about this. It's not like he just like had like armored cars and a security guard detail and blah, 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 you know. And when our verses are recited to them, they say, we have heard, if we will, we could say something like this. This is not but legends of the former people, meaning people were claiming that they could replicate or duplicate the Quran, right? Um, uh, and they claim that it's just legends of a former people. And remember when they said, oh Allah, if this should be the truth from you, 
than rain down upon us stones from the sky or bring us a painful punishment. But Allah would not punish them while you, O Muhammad وسلم, are among them. And Allah would not punish them while they seek forgiveness. Okay, meaning the messenger was there. Great. Obviously, the punishment is not going to take place. But the message was being delivered. And it takes time. Right. And we believe in a just, merciful God. It's not just going to be like, oh, day one, minute one, you saw the Prophet and now you're supposed to immediately believe. I mean, no, right? If things take time. Okay. Uh, carrying on. But why should Allah not punish them while they obstruct people from Al Masjid al Haram and they were not fit to be its guardians? Its true guardians are not but the righteous but most of them do not know. And their prayer at the house, i.e. the Kaaba, was not except whistling and handy, hand clapping. So taste the punishment for what you disbelieve, i.e. practice of deviations. Indeed, those who disbelieve spend their wealth to avert people from the way of Allah. So they will spend it. Then it will be for them a source of regret. Then they will be overcome and those who have disbelieved uh, onto hell, they will be gathered. It is so that Allah may distinguish the wicked from the good and place the wicked, uh, uh, excuse me, and place the wicked, some of them upon others and heap them all together and put them into hell. It is those who are the losers. Look, obviously there's a financial war going on. Obviously, obviously there's an agenda. Obviously there's propaganda, obviously. Right. This is the people that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is addressing and nothing has changed. It's been like this since the dawn of time. Right. Since the dawn of man, it's been like this. The propaganda and the delivery has just been um, uh, different in a sense that before they didn't have television, but they had poetry. OK. They had storytelling. They had um, their arrogance in how they conducted with one another, the circles that they chose to hang around with. And uh the signage that they used to put up, right? Nowadays, it's television, social media, mass media, yada, 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 okay? But it's the same. Uh, people are spending money on this stuff, right? Massive, massive, massive amounts of money. Okay. Um, it, is, it, it is so that Allah may distinguish the wicked from the good and place the wicked, some of them, upon others. Meaning, if you follow the lines of the wicked, you're going to be grouped up on top of them and bundled up and thrown in all together. Like, man, okay, say to those who have disbelieved that if they cease, what has previously occurred will be forgiven for them. Again, a door of mercy. Hey, stop what you're doing and all's good. But if they turn to hostility, then the precedent of the former rebellious peoples has already been has already taken place and fight against them until there is no fitna. And until the religion, i.e. worship of all of it, is for Allah. And if they cease, then indeed Allah is seeing of what they do. But if they turn away, then know that Allah is your protector. Excellent is the protector and excellent is the helper. Meaning you got no better protector, no better helper than God. And you want to uh, eliminate fitna. You want to eliminate these types of um, behaviors that cause harm to society, right? It takes time. But uh, you start the fight with yourself and you start the fight with the difference that you can make, right? Okay, alhamdulillah, that does conclude the ninth juz. So uh, thank you so much for joining me tonight. I will open up the, or excuse me, the link is already posted up there for our non-Muslim guests. Um, I'm going to uh, finish off by saying, Allahumma uh, salli ala Sayyidina wa Habibina Muhammad wa ala ali wa ashabi Muhammad. كما صليت على إبراهيم وعلى آل وأصحاب إبراهيم في العالمين إنك حميد مجيد اللهم بارك على سيدنا وحبيبنا محمد وعلى آل وأصحاب إبراهيم محمد كما باركت على إبراهيم وعلى آل وأصحاب إبراهيم في العالمين إنك حميد مجيد